Welcome to the Feeling Better Podcast. My name is Maria, and I'm the host of this podcast, former gambling addict, and devoted Christian homesteading wife. I'm also the author of the Feeling Better 10-4 program that teaches you a practical, effective, inspirational 10-week program to help you overcome your compulsive gambling addiction, which you can listen to in the first 15 episodes of my podcast. Thanks so much for being here. Before I jump right into this episode, I want to say two things. First, I'd like to pause and publicly thank one of my dear sweet listeners who donated a generous gift of money to me last week. She knows who she is. She's a lovely, inspirational woman that I've gotten to know over these last several months. Yes, I have a donation button on my website, but that's not for anyone who's struggling financially and is dealing with the aftermath of gambling addiction. I don't ever ask for money. It's just there should someone feel led and is in a comfortable position to do so. I also won't ever monetize this podcast. I believe that God will provide for me in other ways. He always has before, and it's by the beautiful spirits of people like my kind-hearted listener that he sometimes blesses me. And when those blessings come, I'm incredibly grateful for those people who are vessels of his spirit that he uses for my benefit. It's amazing. And it's humbling. It's been ridiculously tough these last five months being out of work, but every day we make it through on his manna. The second thing that I want to state is that if you're here listening to this for the first time and this link was sent to you by someone, don't assume that person has a gambling addiction or is a regular listener. This is by far the most important episode I've ever recorded, and so I'm asking folks to share it around. Send to friends and family, or to your church. Send to your online forums and groups. God willing, it will get passed on from person to person to person. I'm an addiction podcaster, yes, but each of my podcast episodes are first and foremost mini Christian guides on how to live better lives according to God's will for us. I often take things that we struggle with, in particular spiritual attack, and break down the truth of God's word while exposing the enemy's lies, which oftentimes become the popular narrative in society. I'm grateful to have a devoted following of regular listeners every week, and I welcome any new subscribers who may have ears to hear. Now, the other day, I began writing out my next chapter for my book, Imbalances, The Addict's Guide to Fixing Our Broken Lives, Chapter 5, The Imbalance of Relationships. But I struggled putting my words together because this situation in the Middle East has been dominating my thoughts. You see, I mentioned a couple of weeks ago that I had some mildly heated discussions within my family, most of whom are Muslim, with only a few of us Christian, about the Israel-Gaza conflict. I made a few points, gave my perspective, and then bowed out, not wanting to get divisive over it. Funny how in our modern generation, there's so much out there that divides us. I suppose there have been issues throughout all of history that divided people, but it seems like it's just so easy these days, with social media and texting and group chats, to have those discussions without being face-to-face. All one has to do is comment or post to spark the flames of a volatile and fiery virtual discussion about politics, social issues, and wars. It's one of the main reasons why I wanted to be off of social media completely, especially with elections coming up next year, as well as economic and social issues that bombard our feeds daily. But as I said previously, I had gotten back on Facebook in order to sell some things on Marketplace and to buy winter firewood for our wood stove, and I just never shut it back down. Big mistake. Big. Huge. There I go with Julia Roberts again. Because I saw yesterday that one of my siblings, my Catholic sister, posted pro-Palestine content. I was totally surprised by that, and so I sent her a text questioning it, but got no reply. But then the next morning on her wall, I happened to see yet more posts, with much stronger language this time, condemning Israel and proclaiming statements of free Palestine, with a declaration that anyone who didn't agree could remove themselves from following her, because genocide was wrong and Israel needed to be stopped. This time, I called her, 
but she didn't answer. And when I texted, she said, I honestly don't want to hear anything you have to say. What Israel is doing is wrong, and that's how I feel, and it doesn't make me any less of a Christian. And that was that. This sibling refused to talk to me or engage in any conversation, text, phone call, or otherwise, because of my pro-Israel stance. I knew that being a Catholic, she didn't get the in-depth Bible studies and didn't know her Bible history as well as I did. So my goal wasn't to argue or even to debate, but to help shed some light with a different perspective. But she refused to even talk to me, which just annoyed me. I understand that some people just shut it all down to avoid confrontation, but nothing irks me more than someone who is closed-minded and refuses to question anything or hear any other point of view. Then, about an hour later, I happened to get a call from my other sister, the only other Christian in our otherwise Muslim family besides me, about something totally unrelated. I chatted with her for roughly 10 minutes, and then I brought up what our other sister had posted on her Facebook page. And even this conversation became heated, because this sister said to me, Yeah, I mean, I totally get why she wouldn't answer her phone or want to talk to you. You can't side with Israel, or take any side really, when there are innocent people dying and suffering. And there are more Palestinians who are suffering than Israelis right now. Besides, everyone knows that Israel isn't innocent in this. Both sides have been fighting for years, and both sides have done atrocious things. So, I mean, we have family in those Arab countries, and they're in the worst position. So, you know, you just have to do the right thing, and hope that they both find peace. But I feel compassion for all the many more Palestinians who are suffering. They don't even have food or water or medicine. But I'm not taking sides. War is awful, and no one should ever take sides in a war. Our focus should be on the innocent civilians who didn't ask for any of this. And so, when I hung up with her, and for several hours afterward, her words hung heavy on my heart. I tried to write out my next podcast episode, but this all just took up space in my brain, not allowing me any creative flow for the topic of imbalanced relationships. So finally, I asked God, do you want me to write about this, to talk about this on my podcast? This was Tuesday at about noon, and as I sit here writing, it's 7 a.m. on Wednesday morning, and I can't even really describe what happened to me other than my brain instantly became flooded with thoughts. Things that I wanted to say, items I wanted to look up, comments I needed to get out via my keyboard before I overflowed with them. I know when God's Spirit is moving me. I don't even think, I just write. I have felt that at least a dozen or more times by now with my episode script writing, so I knew he was allowing the Holy Spirit to guide me. I was deep in the Spirit, flipping pages in my Bible, using torn bits of tissue to mark various places, looking up videos about the Hebrew meanings of words. It was like an Indiana Jones puzzle, and God handed me all the clues to put together for you. I thank him for that, because nothing I've ever done has felt so purposeful and so fulfilling. And to think this time last year, I didn't even feel worthy of living. Anyway, there are plenty of videos and blogs and articles out there about the history of the conflict up until this point, including modern history and who's done what over the years. So I'm not going to go into all of those details. You can find those with a quick Google search or YouTube search. Instead, I'm going to share three it's okay statements about this conflict in a way that you won't likely hear anywhere else online or in any other church. Number one, it's okay to take sides. You know, this may not come as a surprise to you, but I detest some of the things our own government has done over the decades. And personally, I have no doubt that in our country's recent history, the leaders in government, in the alphabet organizations, and even many citizens too, have done some hideous things, including murder, extortion, rape, theft, blackmail, and even pedophilia. It's despicable to even consider, 
But I'd be naive to think that prominent people here in America are all innocent, altruistic, honest, and of the highest integrity. And because humans can be evil and the devil reigns in this world, I can also make the assumption that governments and individual citizens of other countries have also done similar heinous things, including Israel, including Palestine, including Russia and Ukraine, and countries in Europe and Asia. But just because some people in our country, or in your country, or in all of those other countries have done heinous things, does not mean it's wrong to stand up and choose a side in a war. On October 7th, three weeks ago, Hamas conducted a surprise terrorist attack on Israel that resulted in the death of about 1,400 people. Israel has roughly 9.3 million citizens. Journalists and commentators are all calling this attack their version of 9-11. But that would be a massive understatement. The United States has a population of over 330 million, roughly 36 times larger than Israel. And so, proportionately, the terrorist attack by Hamas on Israel three weeks ago would have been the equivalent of more than 50,000 U.S. citizens killed in a terrorist attack. Do you know how many Americans died on 9-11? Just under 3,000. So, for the Hamas attack to be really comparable to a terrorist attack here in the U.S., 16 to 17 times more people would have had to have died on 9-11. Can you even comprehend that number? Here in Michigan, that would have been like terrorists wiping out every person who lives in Ypsilanti or Battle Creek. In California, everyone would have been gone in a city the size of Palm Desert or San Jacinto. In Pennsylvania, it would have been the entire population of Lancaster or Harrisburg. Are you getting the picture? And now, imagine the group of people who committed that horrendous act of terrorism actually was a militant group that lived right across our country's border, who vowed to annihilate every last American and wipe us all off the face of this earth. Would my siblings believe then that it's still wrong to take a stance and choose a side? Let's be honest here. Everyone knows that war sucks, folks. No decent, good human being wants war. No good, decent human being wants others to die and suffer. But the reality is, there are a lot of people in this world who are not good, decent human beings. Sometimes they coalesce together and form evil regimes like the Nazis or Hamas or Hezbollah. And being a Christian believer does not mean you just fold your arms and close your eyes and plug your ears and refuse to take sides because we should always remain neutral. Who says we should never take sides in a war? Sometimes, as horrible as it sounds, war is necessary. If not for war, we'd still have slavery here in the U.S. In fact, if not for war, we wouldn't even be the U.S. We'd still be under Britain's rule. Wars have been fought since the beginning of time. If you're anyone who's read your Bible, you would have read about war after war after war after war. War has always been and will continue to be right up until the end. War exists because sin exists. War exists because evil exists. Wars have been fought over greed, over power, over land, over resources. And sadly, unfortunately, innocent casualties are a result of war. This is heartbreaking, and it's grievous. But just because innocent civilians die in a war does not mean that it isn't okay to take sides. It absolutely is okay to take sides, my friends. In fact, to be frank, it's hard to understand how someone can't take a side, because usually, in my opinion, that means a person either doesn't have all the facts or doesn't have the courage to choose. Remember, I've said several times now that people today want, above all, to be popular, and Satan has convinced the masses that remaining neutral is the safest, most popular place to be. Which brings me to my second point. It's okay to be unpopular. You know whose side I choose? God's side. 
And what is God's side? Well, I'm going to explain it to you, give you the simplest and easiest explanation as succinctly as I can, straight from the source. First, let's start with this. On the Bible Gateway app using the New King James Version of the Bible, do you know how many times Israel appears in Scripture? Just take a wild guess in your mind. If you said 2,400 times, you'd be the winner, winner, chicken dinner. Now, take a wild guess at how many times Palestine appears in the same Bible. If you guessed zero, then you're also a winner. That's because the word Palestine wasn't formally used until 134 years after the birth of Christ, when a Roman emperor of the same regime that condemned Christ to his death on the cross renamed Israel. This emperor, whose name was Hadrian, hated everything about the Jews. He forbid the readings and the teachings of the Torah. He executed Jewish teachers and religious leaders, and he drove the Jews out of the land. Not wanting anything to be remaining of the Jewish people, he renamed Israel Syria-Palestina, after the Philistines, who were the arch enemies of the Jews. It was a big old slap in the face to them, renaming their land after their enemies. And since then, People have called that land Palestine, but never, not once, was it ever formally recognized as an actual country. In contrast, Israel was first mentioned by the writings of Moses way back in the book of Genesis, roughly 1,800 years before the birth of Christ. In the book of Genesis, God gave the land of Israel to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and their descendants. It was first called the land of Canaan, but when God told Jacob, Abraham's grandson, his name would be changed to Israel, God from that point on referred to that land not as Canaan, but a land of Israel. Jacob, now Israel, had 12 sons, who became the first original 12 tribes of Israel. Then, as next generations were born, God called them all the children of Israel, the first families of the land. That land of Israel back then encompassed what today is currently Israel, Gaza, the West Bank, parts of Lebanon, Jordan, and Syria, including the Sinai Peninsula. Israel back then was much larger than it is today. The children of Israel, or the first Israelis, were Jews because Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their families worshipped the one true God and their descendants received the Torah of God's law for his people via Moses, which are the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Some people, my sisters included, insist that the situation is kind of complex, because even though the Jews were around since the days of Moses, Israel didn't formally become a nation until 1948, after World War II and the Holocaust. That's actually not correct. It's only correct if you're insisting that only the UN decides what's a nation. Because Israel was once a very distinct nation and kingdom under King Saul, King David, and King Solomon. The first king of Israel, Saul, was crowned king about a thousand years before the birth of Christ. And it was his successor, King David, who made Jerusalem the capital of Israel. Then David's son, King Solomon, built the first glorious temple of God in Jerusalem on the Temple Mount, where the Islamic Mosque now stands. My first point in any debate over the Israel-Hamas-Gaza situation is that the Muslims somehow claimed the Temple Mount was their right and then built the Alaska Islamic Mosque where two Jewish temples once stood. How is that even right? The Jews own Israel— and Jerusalem is in Israel. The Jews built their sacred holy temple more than 1,500 years before Muhammad was even born, long, long before Islam ever even existed. And somehow, this is all accepted by the rest of the world. And yet, they can't figure out why there can't be peace in the Middle East? Once, several months back, I'd been in a chat debate with my father, who currently lives in the Middle East. We were discussing the mosque and Gaza, and he had said to me, Listen, you have to understand. It's for you like growing up in America. 
and knowing all the lands were taken away from the native Indians. The mosque and the West Bank and Gaza were rightfully ours, like the Indians, but the Jews are like the American white man who keep trying to take it from the natives. I was like, oh, okay, you know the Jews occupied that area long before the Muslims, right? They were there many, many centuries before Islam even existed, so you actually have that backward. That land all belongs to the Jews, and it's been theirs since the time of Abraham. They officially got it back in 1948, but the Muslims still kept parts of it. He wrote back and said, No, this is not about the Muslims and the Jews, but about the Arabs and the Jews. The Arabs were there long before there were even Jews. We Arabs didn't just come from Ishmael's line. Some of us Arabs were also Canaanites and Philistines which is why the land belonged to us first, long before even the debate between Isaac and Ishmael. What he was talking about is that many Muslim Arabs state that Ishmael was Abraham's firstborn, so he should have been the one who rightfully inherited the land given by God to Abraham. Remember, Islam is an Abrahamic religion as well, meaning they fully believe everything right up to the point of Abraham. But then they say the Jews corrupted the text in the history, and that because he was first born, Ishmael was really the one that should have gotten the land, not Isaac. There are two things wrong with that. For one, Ishmael wasn't a legitimate child born out of the marriage between Abraham and his wife, Sarah. Ishmael was born out of wedlock, from Abraham sleeping with his wife's maid, Hagar. The second thing is, there is archaeological and anthropological evidence for the Israelite slaves in Egypt and the exodus out of Egypt. In the Muslim Quran, Surah 3, Al-Imran, verse 84 translated says this, We believe in God and in what was revealed to us and in what was revealed to Abraham and Ishmael and Isaac and Jacob and the patriarchs and in what was given to Moses and Jesus and the prophets from their Lord. We make no distinction between any of them, and to him we submit. Well, that kind of negates the argument that Christians corrupted the historical text now, doesn't it? Even the Muslims state in their Quran that they believe in what was given to Moses, and Jesus, and all the prophets. So that seems strangely conflicting to me, but I digress. Anyway, back to the conversation with my father. Putting the Ishmael thing aside, because there's zero evidence whatsoever to support that argument, I began to mull over what he said about Arabs also being Canaanites and Philistines who were in the land in the very beginning, before Abraham ever went there. Not coincidentally, later that day, I saw a comment by a gal I don't even know, who said almost the exact same thing. I took a screenshot of it, and she wrote, the Palestinians are descendants of the Canaanites. They've lived there for thousands of years. Hmm, well, you know me. Inquiring minds need to know. Was that really true? I decided to do some digging. One of the things I found was a link to an article from science.org that showed most Arabs and Jews shared the same DNA that came from one common paternal ancestor. That was super interesting, but I suppose not surprising. I realized quickly, though, that I didn't want to rely on the internet for answers. My listeners should know me by now. I prefer to be like the Bereans and test everything against scripture. One of the things I discovered was that my father and the gal posting that comment about the Canaanites actually weren't wrong. Well, they weren't wrong from the world history point of view, but they are wrong from the godly point of view. And this is what makes this whole entire conflict so complex. Because when it comes right down to it, the answer to the question of who has the right to that land and which side is the right side to take in this war can be found in two different truths. And both truths are in complete opposition to each other. One truth is the historical world truth, and the other is God's truth. And today, the vast majority of our planet's population views the situation from the world's truth rather than God's truth. But that shouldn't come as a shock to anyone. So right now, 
I'm going to share with you both of those truths so that you have the understanding of both sides and can make your own informed decision. And it all hinges on that fleeting conversation I had with my father. At the time, I had no idea how pivotal it would be to this episode, but the good Lord brought it forward in my mind, and that's what led me down this path of dissecting it all for you here at its core. Funny thing, after I had all my notes written out and began organizing my thoughts on this topic into a formal script on Thursday morning, I happened to listen to an incredible new video by Pastor Skip Heitzig of Calvary Church titled, Israel or Palestine? Who's Right? And he makes several of the points that I'm making here, but with much more detail about the recent history, as well as some of the myths versus facts of what people are saying around the world. I'll link it in the show notes of this episode, but one of the most eloquently stated things he said was that this world belongs to God. He's the one that created it, and he's the owner of it. Long ago, God deeded that land to Israel, and there was no expiration of that deed. It doesn't matter who lived there before or who claims it's theirs now. It doesn't change the truth. In our human society, Wills and inheritance claims get argued all the time in courts regarding land. It has for centuries and centuries. Yet regardless of who contests the will or believes the inheritance is rightfully theirs, the facts are facts. There is an owner and there is a deed, and the owner of that contested land is God and he deeded it to Israel. And that deed is the Bible. There are a lot of people who don't believe in God and who definitely don't believe in the Bible. And I'm not here to talk to them. I'm here to talk to you, my Christian brother or sister. I don't want you to be like my sisters who just blindly follow the narrative given to them by social media and news clips. I want you to have all the facts as to how and why this land belongs to Israel. And it all starts with Noah. What? Noah? Bet you didn't see that coming. Most everyone who speaks on this subject starts with Abraham, but I want to go back even further. Again, recall that I discovered that the Arabs and Jews had, according to genetic science, the same DNA from the same ancestor. Later on, the two would split off going in two separate ways, for the most part via religion. And that one common ancestor they both shared was Noah. Allow me to explain. You know the story of Noah and his family on the ark, right? Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Shem was the oldest of the three. Now, first up, the Jewish people. Abraham was a direct descendant of Noah's oldest son, Shem, as depicted in the genealogy from Genesis chapter 11. And the genealogy of Jesus from Luke chapter 3 shows us that Jesus is a direct descendant of Abraham. Therefore, Jesus was a descendant of Noah's son Shem. Remember, the birthright and inheritance of the father gets passed down to the oldest legitimate son. Second on the list, the Arabs. Well, the Arabs my father was talking about who first settled in Canaan, now Israel, not the ones that come from the line of Ishmael. Remember, we're going farther back. Now, I'm no biblical scholar, but it's not hard to tell from scripture that many of the Arabs referred to today come from Noah's son, Ham. Genesis chapter 10, which is titled The Table of Nations, tells us that Ham had four sons. This is the clan where many of the Ites groups come from. If you know your Bible, then you know what I mean. The Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites, yada, yada, yada. But what's important to note about this genealogy is that scripture says this clan of Ham is the line where the Philistines come from. And it also tells us that from Ham came the people that settled in Babylon, Nineveh, and Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh Uh-oh, you might know where this is going. More on this in a moment. The third son was Japheth, and that chapter tells us that this part of the family spread out to the north to the Caucasus areas like Armenia, Georgia, and Albania, as well as areas around the Black Sea, parts of Turkey, as well as areas like Greece, Sardinia, Crete, etc. 
The passage about this family says, from Genesis chapter 10, verse 5, From these the maritime peoples spread out into their territories by their clans within their nations, each with its own language. Okay, got that? So, what's so critically important about these three sons and their spread of nationalities and clans? Let's take out Japheth's clan for the time being, because that part of the family that spread across the northern sea areas is not critical to the beginning part of my story here. That leaves Shem and Ham. As we look throughout all of biblical history in the Old Testament, there are two main things that God clearly abhors, sexual immorality and worshiping false gods. There are hundreds and hundreds of references in scripture to both of those things. Even God's children, the Israelites, committed those crimes against God, and you can see the Lord's correction and punishment towards Israel over and over, trying to get them to stop. But correction, punishment, and discipline is much different than eternal curses and separation from God. We've talked about that here in earlier episodes. God corrects and disciplines his children, those he loves. See Proverbs 3, 11 through 12, and Hebrews 12, verses 4 through 13. That correction does not ever remove his promises for his children. So, back to Noah's sons, from whom the Arabs and the Jews once came, as brothers. Let me read you this, from Genesis chapter 9, verses 18 through 27. Now the sons of Noah who went out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the whole earth was populated. And Noah had become a farmer and he planted a vineyard. Then he drank of the wine and was drunk, and became uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father, and told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both their shoulders, and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned away, and they did not see their father's nakedness. So Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done to him. Then he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be to his brothers. He also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth and let him dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. Now, the average reader of that might say, what? I don't understand. What's the big deal about seeing your father naked? It's not that serious. But for hours, I poured over commentary and Hebrew explanations of the words because God pointed me to this verse. It's obviously significant. And so in my digging, I found out that this text is obviously kind of ambiguous. It doesn't seem to tell us much. And you know me, I like the details. But very few details are provided here. No one can seem to understand exactly what happened. But there are three theories. The first is the least likely explanation, that it was shameful to be naked and exposed in such a way, and that Ham should have felt embarrassed for his father and covered him up, having respect and honor for his father. But he didn't. Instead, he went out and told his brothers, presumably in a mocking, making fun sort of way. Why tell the other brothers? Why not just cover up his father? And so that embarrassment and shame resulted in a curse. Another, more plausible explanation is that some incident of sexual immorality occurred inside that tent between Ham and Noah. Leviticus chapter 18 has a full set of sexual rules and laws that Moses gave to the Israelites, and nearly all of those use the phrase, see the nakedness or uncover the nakedness in some form or fashion. It's a euphemism for considering or acting in some kind of sexual way or having sexual thoughts or voyeurism. Maybe leads to sexual intercourse, but it's a broader term that encompasses some form of sexual immorality. This explanation essentially concludes that Ham had sex with his father while he was passed out and drunk. This is more probable than the first explanation because A. 
It doesn't seem likely that an entire line of Noah's descendants would forever be cursed just because his son saw him naked. Even if he was embarrassed, that was pretty harsh. And B, look how it says in the text that when Noah woke up from his drunken state, he knew what Ham had done to him. But the third and most likely explanation, in my personal opinion, and from other scholars, comes from a clue in that 18th chapter of Leviticus, where Moses gives a whole list of God's rules and laws about sexual sin. Verse 8 says this, The nakedness of your father's wife you shall not uncover. It is your father's nakedness. In other words, if you commit sexual sin with your father's wife, either your mother or your stepmother, then you have committed a grievous sin against your father. Again, the euphemism, uncovering his nakedness. So when the text from the story of Noah and Ham says, saw the nakedness of his father, that very likely meant that Ham's mother was in the tent as well. And while Noah was passed out, Ham had committed sexual incest with his mother. Notice that twice during that passage, it states distinctly that Ham was the father of Canaan. Ham had three other sons, as told to us in Genesis chapter 10. Canaan was the youngest. Why only focus on Canaan? And what was the reason Noah put a curse on Ham's son, Canaan, instead of Ham directly? And why didn't Noah curse or even mention the other three sons of Ham? The text doesn't say, so this is simply interpretation and speculation by theologians and biblical teachers and scholars. But most assume that Canaan was the result of Ham sleeping with his mother, a child of incest. The verse states that Noah woke up and knew what Ham had done. The next line is, Then Noah said, and Noah proceeds with his curse. Was the then Noah said something he proclaimed sometime later when he found out his wife was pregnant with child or once the child was born? Or had Canaan already been born at that point and this is something that had happened before on different occasions? We don't know, nor do we know for sure which of those three explanations is the right one. But regardless, it doesn't really matter. All that matters is one, Noah, a man of God, and the one whom God saved from the great flood, cursed his grandson Canaan. And two, from that grandson came the sexually immoral people that settled in the towns of Sodom and Gomorrah, which God burned to the ground for their wickedness. They were also a people who worshipped false gods. And three, the same grandson, Canaan, also occupied all the land, the promised land of Canaan, that God gave to Abraham, who came from the line of Noah's oldest son, Shem. And four, from that moment on, the remainder of the Old Testament becomes one long, intricate, amazing story about how God's main goal was to see his children— the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who was later renamed Israel, occupy and live in the land he gave them while they honored him and lived righteously and did not sin against him. Of course, being human, they failed at that miserably, which is ultimately why God eventually sent Jesus to be their savior. But allow me to read, for the record, so that the truth is out there, what God's promise was to the people of Israel, from Genesis 17, verses 1 through 8. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am El Shaddai, God Almighty. Serve me faithfully and live a blameless life. I will make a covenant with you, by which I will guarantee to give you countless descendants. At this, Abram fell face down on the ground. Then God said to him, This is my covenant with you. I will make you the father of a multitude of nations. What's more, I am changing your name. It will no longer be Abram. Instead, you will be called Abraham, for you will be the father of many nations. I will make you extremely fruitful. Your descendants will become many nations, and kings will be among them. I will confirm my covenant with you and your descendants after you, from generation to generation, This is the everlasting covenant. I will always be your God and the God of your descendants after you. 
I will give you the entire land of Canaan, where you now live as a foreigner, to you and to your descendants. It will be their possession forever, and I will be their God. Ever since then, my friends, Satan, the enemy of God, has tried to separate Israel from God and take away their inheritance, both in this world, meaning the land, and in the eternal. I've said before that spiritual attack comes in many, many forms. One of the ways Satan has attacked God's people, Israel, is by providing Canaan's cursed line of descendants with yet another false god, Allah, the God of Islam. And that leads me to my third and final point, friends. It's okay to side with God versus Satan. In fact, if you're a Christ believer, you should always side with God, the ruler of his people, versus Satan, who is the ruler of everyone else in this world. In scripture, God promised the Jewish people, the 12 tribes of Israel, all the land of Canaan. And God, in order to fulfill this promise, had instructed Joshua, the assistant of Moses, to take his men and conquer the enemy people, who were all the Canaanites that lived in the land. This is what the opening passage of the book of Joshua says, After the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant. He said, Moses, my servant, is dead. Therefore, the time has come for you to lead these people, the Israelites, across the Jordan River into the land that I am giving them. I promise you what I promised Moses. Wherever you set foot, you will be on land that I have given you, from the Negev wilderness in the south to the Lebanon mountains in the north, from the Euphrates River in the east to the Mediterranean Sea in the west, including all the land of the Hittites. No one will be able to stand against you as long as you live, for I will be with you as I was with Moses. I will not fail you or abandon you. Notice, folks, that God does not say, from the Negev wilderness in the south to the Lebanon mountains in the north, except for Gaza and the West Bank coastline. And notice God does not say, from the Euphrates River in the east to the Mediterranean Sea in the west, except for Palestine or Philistia. Again, the Romans, who worshipped false gods and goddesses like Jupiter, Juno, Apollo, and Minerva, etc., were not God's people. It was the Romans who declared the creation and the existence of Palestine. Palestine was never mentioned in the Bible. Prior to the Roman Empire, it was simply a small part of the land of Canaan. So, in a nutshell, it all comes down to this— And this may make me lose a lot of listeners and followers, but that's not something I'm concerned with. I have always, from the beginning, concerned myself with ensuring that you can see God's truth through the veil of the enemy's lies. And the truth is this. There are two sides. One is that the Canaanites, who were the original descendants from Noah's son Ham, that are for the most part Arab Muslims today, were the first ones on the land. That's the historical world truth of man. But the biblical holy truth that comes from the word of God tells us that the people of Canaan were cursed because of sin, and the Lord Almighty took the land of Canaan and gave it to Shem's line, which included Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In other words, Israel. Adam and Eve once sinned against God, and because of that, A long-standing, multi-millennia, multi-generational curse was put in place for all of their descendants. And then, after the Great Flood, the family tree of Adam and Eve continued on through Noah's family tree. God then split that tree into three distinct trees. One was a cursed tree. One was a holy blessed tree of Abraham. And the third, the tree of Japheth that settled into the wilderness in the north, which is now Europe, whose people were called Gentiles, was also a special tree to God. And some of that tree, like me, were grafted into that holy blessed tree by the blood of one from that line, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Messiah. But all the people from Japheth's tree were not grafted into the holy blessed tree by default. We Gentiles, the people from Japheth's tree, have to make the choice to become part of God's holy family. 
That's why we must choose to believe in Christ and to repent in Christ and to be saved by Christ, as Paul states in Romans chapter 11. For if the roots of the tree are holy, the branches will be too. Some of these branches from Abraham's tree, some of the people of Israel, have been broken off. And you Gentiles, who were branches from a wild olive tree, have been grafted in. So now you also receive the blessing that God has promised Abraham and his children, sharing in the rich nourishment from the root of God's special olive tree. But you must not brag about being grafted in to replace the branches that were broken off. You are just a branch, not the root. Well, you may say, those branches were broken off to make room for me. Yes, but remember, those branches were broken off because they didn't believe in Christ, and you are there because you do believe. So don't think highly of yourself, but fear what could happen. For if God did not spare the original branches, he won't spare you either. Notice how God is both kind and severe. He is severe toward those who disobeyed, but kind to you if you continue to trust in his kindness. But if you stop trusting, you also will be cut off. And if the people of Israel turn from their unbelief, they will be grafted in again, for God has the power to graft them back into the tree. You, by nature, were a branch cut off from a wild olive tree. So if God was willing to do something contrary to nature by grafting you into his cultivated tree, he will be far more eager to graft the original branches back into the tree where they belong. I want you to understand this mystery, dear brothers and sisters, so that you will not feel proud about yourselves. Some of the people of Israel have hard hearts, but this will last only until the full number of Gentiles comes to Christ, and so all of Israel will be saved. Romans eleven sixteen through 26 Folks, to summarize everything that I've shared up until this point, it's pretty simple. People who are neither Jewish believers of the God of Israel or grafted into God's family of Israel by the blood of Christ do not belong to him. They are not part of his family. This includes Muslims. To hear more about the Islamic religion and where it came from, I encourage you to go listen to episode 20 of my podcast titled Islam vs. Christianity, The Spiritual Attack of a False Religion. I'll link that episode in the show notes of this one as well. In that episode, I share quite a bit of my own story growing up as a Muslim and then get in-depth about why Islam, Allah, and the Quran are all representatives of a false religion created by Satan. If you go check that out, you might want to listen at a slightly faster speed. I slowed the audio down in that recording so that people of other nations and languages, in particular Arabic, can understand and absorb it easier. So, what does this all mean for us? The bottom line is, I always align, or always do my best to align, with God. Those who support Palestine in this conflict are calling for the defeat of Zionists. Well, do you know who's a Zionist? God. So, if you agree with the Palestinian supporters, you too are calling for the defeat of God. Throughout time, there have been wars and conflicts. Nothing happens in this world without a purpose, and it's all according to God's plan and design for His people, whether nations, media outlets, or social media movements believe it or not. Does each and every individual have the opportunity to repent and be saved in his or her lifetime? Absolutely. Does each and every individual have the opportunity to have a relationship with God and be grafted into his family in faith? Absolutely. But it's up to the individual. As a whole, with regard to peoples and nations and kingdoms, God will use those who are not his to further his plan for his people. Sometimes that means defeating or destroying other nations. Sometimes that means people will suffer and die. In fact, oftentimes that means people will suffer and die, whether that's with something big like a war or something more individual like cancer or a drug overdose or a car accident. Sometimes even his own beloved people have to suffer and die. 
Just look at Christ's twelve disciples. All but John were martyred for their faith. Or take the Holocaust. Six million Jews died in the Holocaust of World War II at the hand of an evil dictator who was intent on wiping out God's people. It was sickening, despicable, unimaginable. Yet something of that magnitude had to occur in order for Israel to be reborn as a nation in a single day, as predicted by the prophet Isaiah in chapter 66, verse 8. There are other predictions in Scripture as well. Isaiah also predicted in chapter 17, verse 1, that Damascus will no longer be a city, but one day will become a heap of ruins. So far, Damascus, which is in Syria, has always been a city and has never been a heap of ruins. So that's yet still to come. Also, the prophet Ezekiel predicts a war in chapters 38 and 39 where God gives Ezekiel a message about the future. Someday, there's going to be a big war against Israel, known as the Gog and Magog War, where a big, powerful army from a kingdom far in the north will align itself with the Middle Eastern countries and wage a massive attack on Israel at a time when the country is living in relative peace and safety. The prophecy from Ezekiel essentially tells us that the people from the line of Noah's son Ham, the Arabs, and the people from Noah's other son, Japheth, the people of the north, will come together to attack and overthrow the people of Shem's line, the Israelis. Could this conflict right now be the start of that? Possibly. Or maybe that's still far off in the future. God says that when that day happens, his anger will be aroused and there will be a massive, devastating earthquake in the land that will shake the mountains and cause the cliffs to crumble. Biblical scholars and theologians have long speculated about who this great northern kingdom will be. Turkey? Maybe Russia? Whoever it is aligns with the Persians that we know is modern-day Iran, and that's all going to coalesce on a massive war against Israel. Who knows? Only time will tell, but we're certainly seeing evidence of how that can happen today, right? Whoever the modern-day players turn out to be, they will anger God. Ezekiel 38 verses 19 through 23 gives that bold and evil army a message from God. I promise a mighty shaking in the land of Israel on that day. All living things, the fish in the sea, the birds of the sky, the animals of the field, the small animals that scurry along the ground, and all the people on the earth will quake in terror at my presence. Mountains will be thrown down, cliffs will crumble, Walls will fall to the earth. I will summon the sword against you on all the hills of Israel, says the Sovereign Lord. Your men will turn their swords against each other. I will punish you and your armies with disease and bloodshed. I will send torrential rain, hailstones, fire, and burning sulfur. In this way, I will show my greatness and holiness, and I will make myself known to all the nations of the world they will know that I am the Lord. That sounds like a massive, massive earthquake. Maybe even that earthquake will come in the form of a huge mega bomb or something nuclear. War is awful, my friends. It's horrific in every aspect. But as long as humanity lives, until Jesus comes back for God's people, there is going to be war. Why? Well, because the war is not against flesh and blood, but rather against the dark powers and the evil forces in the spiritual realm. Evil is very real, and it comes from Satan. We Christians often pray for Christ's return. In fact, one of my all-time favorite songs is Come Jesus Come by Stephen McWhorter. It's haunting, it's beautiful, it's soulful, and one can't help but to pray for Jesus to come back for us when you hear it. But there are things that have to happen before Christ comes back. God needs to move all the chess pieces in place to defeat the enemy first. He doesn't provide us with all the details, but we have enough to know that the time is very near. And Satan knows that too. The clock is running down and we're in the final days. Believe me, the devil knows the Bible just as well, if not better than you and me. 
And so he's ramping up his playbook and getting his strategic battle plans in place. He didn't win the first time he tried to overthrow God, but he's had thousands of years to devise a new plan and carry out attacks in this spiritual war. I can't imagine Satan is stupid enough to believe he's going to win over God, but I do think that he intends to take down as much of humanity as he possibly can before the end, to rob humans of the other promise that God gave to his family, the promise and inheritance of eternal life. The main target of his offensive strategy is Israel, along with the rest of us Christ believers. And he's gathering as many Zion haters as he can for his own evil army. As Pastor Jack Hibbs explained in his recent sermon about the Israeli-Palestine conflict, these terrorist Arab regimes want the Jews dead. They want Israel wiped off the map, annihilated. Pastor Jack eloquently said that if Hamas and Hezbollah laid down their guns and weapons and vowed never to fire another shot or missile again, Lebanon, Iran, Syria, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, even Palestine would still exist. You'd still find them a decade from now, two decades from now. But if Israel laid down its guns and weapons and vowed never to fire another shot or missile again, it would cease to exist. Hamas and Hezbollah would overtake it and claim the land as their own within days. Has anyone ever stopped and pondered why? Why do these Islamic extremists hate the Jews so much and want that tiny country of Israel when the Muslim Arabs currently have so much country and so much land surrounding it? It's a very simple answer, my friends. The Jews are God's children, and the land of Israel was his gift to them. And Islam is the religion of the devil. Now, I'm not saying that every Muslim is a terrorist or that every Muslim is a Satan worshiper or is evil. Remember, I have family that are Muslim. Most Muslims are good, innocent, everyday people who have simply been deceived. But unfortunately, they worship a false god. And every false god that has ever existed has been an invention of Satan intended to deceive masses of people into turning away from the one true God. There are hundreds of stories in the Bible about the fate of people who worship false gods, and it never ends well for them. As a people, as a whole, the most vocal, the most evil, the most powerful, and the most corrupt, the most deceived Muslims, wield an unrelenting, vile, vicious hatred of God's children. The reality is, though, God is going to defend his children and protect his children at all costs, and that may mean innocent Muslims will lose their lives. Think about this. Most of us today in Western society have lived a safe, comfortable, cushy life where the only war and atrocious acts of violence we've ever known comes from Hollywood movies. But what if, right now, there were people trying to break into your house filled with evil and rage and violence, intent on killing your children and annihilating your family. Would you not fight to the death to protect them and defend them? Would you care who you killed if it meant keeping your family alive? This conflict, this war that's going on right now, this is not a war for power or resources. Israel isn't bombing Gaza because they're trying to gain something. They are in the fight of their lives. This is a war of survival, because if Israel doesn't win, they don't exist. And once again, Pastor Jack says it simply and truthfully. If Israel doesn't exist, then that negates all the scripture, all the promises of God, all our inheritance of afterlife. It voids the death of Jesus on the cross and his resurrection. And as a Christian believer, I trust in God, in his word in his promises, in his plan for this world. Now, do I think that the United States is being godly and altruistic in remaining an ally with Israel and supporting them in this war? No, I don't. I think perhaps once upon a time, decades and decades ago, there were some faithful Christ believers in government that inherently understood that if there was one nation out there to align with in this world, Israel was it. 
But now I think that the U.S. is getting involved in other countries' wars because there's a lot of money to be made off of war. The intelligent, sensible thing to do would be for America to have most of its troops and bases and submarines and aircraft carriers all along every border, on every coastline of ours, in every part of the water, in a protective bubble around our country. But no, we leave our borders wide open and our country defenseless, while we establish bases and put troops in every other part of the world. And I believe, in my opinion, it's because there's more money to be made getting ourselves involved in other nations' conflicts through contractors and aid packages under the guise of, quote, world peace. Our country here in the U.S. once, as a whole, honored and worshipped the one true God of Israel. But now we are a nation that, as a whole, worships false gods, gods of greed and power and lust, and that is not going to end well for us either. But that's a rabbit trail that I'm not going to go down right now. Allow me to close with this, friends. I stand with Israel, always, forever, in every circumstance, not because the Israeli people are all guilt-free and innocent and blameless. I mean, there isn't a single person or country, for that matter, on this earth that is guilt-free innocent, and blameless. No, I stand with Israel because as a Gentile, meaning non-Jew, who's grafted into that blessed family tree, I too am a child of God. And that's my family fighting for survival. That's my family that I know will win this war. Because in the end, God wins. I know how this story ends. I will choose God above all, before everything, every single time. I might fall prey to an unsuspecting spiritual attack, like my gambling addiction, but that's one of the several reasons why Satan even bothered with me to begin with. But let me state this with absolute certainty, and I don't care if I lose all of my listeners or get shunned by all of my family. I will never deny the one true God or my faith in Christ which gives me a place in my true family, my real family. Yes, I'm here on this podcast to help people find mental and spiritual healing through their addiction. But first and foremost, I am a Christian. I am a Christian before I'm a podcaster. I'm a Christian before I'm a wife or a sister or a homesteader or a wage earner. I don't care if that means I have to struggle living paycheck to paycheck for the rest of my life, or if I have to suffer and die for my faith. Not to get all dramatic with it, but let's face it, what can mere humans do to me? Paul tells us in Romans 8.18 that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. 1 Peter 4.15 says, If you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear his name. I could not go on another week, continuing with my book, without stopping for this crucial interlude, to give you what I wholeheartedly believe, provided by the Spirit within me, is a different perspective on the situation than what you might be hearing from the media, or political pundits, or even your friends and family. My Christian brothers and sisters, we are living in historic times. They are complicated, disturbing, and maybe even frightening to some. But don't let it frighten or upset you. What an amazing blessing it is to even be chosen to live in this era, to be witness to the end times plan of God unfolding. Pray for his people. Pray for your own wisdom and guidance. Pray that you will be protected by attacks from the enemy. But most of all, pray that you won't be deceived by what the masses are saying and believing and insisting is truth. Test everything against scripture and hold firm to your beliefs and your faith. And don't just regurgitate everything that you hear or see on social media or from other people. Be discerning. Ask God to give you wisdom and do your own research. Next week, I'll be going right back to Chapter 5, The Imbalance of Relationships, and continue guiding you on how to remove ourselves spiritually and mentally from the Babylonian system of Satan, 
where you don't sway or waver unbalanced in the truth of how God commands us to live our lives. There's so much more at stake right now, no gambling pun intended, than our finances, our anxieties, our jobs, our social media following, our homes and our clothes and our possessions. Keep your eyes on God, my friends, and see the war taking place right now for what it really is. God on one side and the enemy of God on the other. And that's all it is. Choose your side wisely. Put on his full armor and stand firm in your faith. Let's close in prayer, shall we? Father God, Sovereign Lord, we humbly come before you right now to thank you for all of our blessings. I thank you for those who have listened up until the end, who are still here pondering your plan for your children of Israel, feeling your spirit move them. Bless the person on the other side of this, who hears this, with eyes to see and ears to hear and wisdom to discern good from evil. Use us in your great war against the enemy, whether it's to be prayer warriors or to help others understand the battles taking place in the spiritual realm. Protect us, guide us, forgive us for those times we go our own way or get distracted by the things of this world. God, I ask that you would nudge people to share this podcast around. Let it grow legs and be heard if it's your will and your message for those who need to hear it so that those who know you will stand as a strong fortress around your special tree, so that those who don't know you yet will open their hearts to you and allow Jesus to graft them in as children of your family. Let the faithful be loud and bold and unwavering and strong and firm in our stance for you, Lord, always for you. In Christ's precious name we pray, amen. God bless, stay safe, and I'll see you all again next Sunday. Like holy water, like